impressed me is when we got back from our trip, we were picking up cars, and Larry needs to follow up on this man. I, I don't know who this man was. Uh, me and another fellow were talking, and this man just walked. I didn't even know someone else in the parking lot. He walked right up, and he says, what is this that the, the flesh means nothing to God? Everything has to do with the soul. How come God's not concerned about the flesh? And, and I, didn't know, I didn't know who this guy is. I didn't know if he knew I studied scripture. Uh, he, that, he, no introduction, that was his statement to me. And I says, well, our flesh is sinful, and only after we trust Jesus Christ as our Savior can, does God save us from our sin and put his spirit within us, and then our bodies are useful to God. And he goes, oh, okay. And then he says... Uh, um, something about, uh, does that mean then that all, all the good works that we do, it means nothing to God? And I said, yes, that's true. If you're not saved, if you haven't believed in the blood of Jesus Christ as the payment for your sin, all the good works you do in life do nothing to please God. Uh, so that they that are in the flesh cannot please God. And, uh, but after you get saved, according to verse... No, we're going to have trouble with this again, aren't we? Verse 9 there tells us that we're not in the flesh. God doesn't see us in the flesh, if so be that the Spirit of God is in us. And when you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're, you're taken and you're put into Jesus Christ, and God no longer sees us in our flesh. He sees us in Christ, and, and therefore the work that we do in the flesh now, it says down there in verse 12, but if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal body. A mortal body is the body that's yet going to die. It's a body yet subject to death. That the Spirit of God that raised up Christ from the dead dwells in us, and that same Spirit is able to make this body, quicken it, make it alive unto God. But it's not us, it's the Spirit of God living and working in us that allows this body to be a vehicle that brings glory to God. And, uh, and so then afterwards I talked to this man about his salvation because he's asking the right questions, uh, but unless he gets saved, he, he, he'll never be useful to God, and it starts with salvation. I say that to you because if you're starting with us in Romans chapter 8, there's something else that's more important than Romans chapter 8 for you, and if you go back to Romans chapter 5, I'll show it to you. Romans chapter 5, it said it brings a conclusion of the first five chapters, or at least the first four chapters of the book of Romans. And it makes a, a, a real profound statement in just a very short verse. Romans chapter 5 and verse 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Being saved means to be declared righteous before a holy God. If you would have read earlier in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, you find out that there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that doeth good. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so you and I will never reach God's standard. We will never be good enough in ourselves to be declared righteous before a holy God. But when you read what Jesus Christ did and understand why Jesus Christ came into the world, look down in verse 6 of chapter 5. It says, For when we were yet without strength, unable to save ourselves, have knowing, no, no, no ability within ourselves to save ourselves, to keep us from sin or to save us from our own sins, when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Well, that's what a sinner is, is someone who's ungodly. It says, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. The problem is there's none righteous and there's none good. So it says in verse 8, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And Jesus Christ came into this world at the due time, when, when the Bible has pronounced and convicted and condemned the whole world under sin, Jesus Christ comes into the world and he dies on the cross, and the Bible tells us why he died. He died for our sins. He took our place, he was our substitute, and he hung and died on a cross. He who knew no sin, the Bible says, was made sin for us. God took our sins and laid them on the Lord Jesus Christ, and he died on the cross, and he paid for our sins so that our sins could be taken away before the eyes of a holy God. Not just, God didn't just close his eyes to our sins. He laid them on Christ, and Jesus Christ paid for them so that the sins are taken out of the way. They're paid for. And now when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that he did that for you, that he died for your sins, was buried, and rose again, God the Father imputes to you the righteousness of Jesus Christ, puts it to your account. He actually sees you, as you learn in Romans 6, he sees you in Christ. 
and God then declares you righteous on the basis of faith. That's what it means in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, therefore being justified by faith. That is a person who put their faith in the blood of Jesus Christ, God the Father declares them righteous, and he justly does so. He's not lying when he says that I'm righteous. He saw that there was a time in, in, in my life where I trusted what Jesus Christ did on the cross as the payment for my sins, and God put to my account the righteousness of Jesus Christ, and when he says justified, he's right, because I'm declared righteous in Christ, and God's the one who declared me righteous. My sins are forgiven, I'm declared righteous in his sight, and therefore I have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now that's what Romans 1 through 5 is about. Now after you're saved, God continues to work, and when you learn in Romans chapter 6 is that when you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are by the Spirit placed into Jesus Christ. The term in Romans 6 is baptized, and it has nothing to do with water baptism. It has to do with the Holy Spirit of God placing us into Jesus Christ. Not baptism into water, but baptism into Christ, and the body therefore being dead so that we could live to, for God. Romans chapter 7, we learn that by the newness of the Spirit we are to walk according to, uh, uh, to God's grace rather than the oldness of the letter. And what that means, and you'll learn about it a little bit more as we go into Romans chapter 8, is that the oldness of the letter, men used to live according to the law of God. But now there's, God is dealing with us in a, in a new way. In Romans chapter 5, in verse 2, it, uh, verse 2 it says, By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God, and not only so, but we glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, patience experience, experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. When we became justified by faith, God put his Holy Spirit in us. That's the first the reason I had to go back there to chapter 5. That's the first mention of the Holy Spirit in the book of Romans. And, and it's not mentioned again, except there's a walking in the newness of the Spirit in Romans chapter 7, and it's not mentioned again until the Holy Spirit's ministry, until you get to Romans chapter 8, and there's where we're learning about the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our life. We learned in Romans chapter 6 that we're placed into Christ's death so that we can live a newness of life. Romans chapter 7 says that we don't walk in the oldness of the letter, we walk in the newness of the Spirit. There's a new way to live for the Lord today, and it's not according to the law, it's according to the newness of His Spirit that He's given to us. And then you come to Romans chapter 8, and you learn the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. That the Spirit of God that raised Christ from the dead, if it's in you, and if you're saved, He is in you, then He can quicken this mortal body to live for God. And that's where we're at, Romans chapter 8. And, and we just quoted what's in verse 11 right there, uh, verse, uh, verse 10. But verse 11, it says, But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal body by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to, live, uh, debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. Now that's not talking about damnation. That's talking, about live, that's talking about you going through life and having no productivity, no life of God uh, manifested in your life, no fruit unto God uh, that's going to be of any glory to God. It, it's as, as if you're going through life dead. Uh, it says in, in, uh, in the book of Timothy about a woman who is a, uh, a widow and goes out and lives into the world. It says she's dead while she liveth. That is... Her life doesn't count for God. It has no glory, no, no goodness for God. It's not the life of God dwelling in that person. And so if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. But, it says, but if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the flesh, ye shall live. That is, now the Spirit of God's in you, and by that Spirit of God, through the Spirit of God, you put to death the deeds of the flesh. You say, I'm not going to live for the flesh. I'm going to live for God, and you do that by the Spirit of God, then you live for God. Now your life, now you've got God's life manifested in you, and you are living for the Lord if by the Spirit you do that. And, and so that's what, what you're learning here, the power of God through the Spirit to live in you in this life and make this life count for the glory of God. Now, we've, we've learned all that. And in Romans chapter 8 and verse 14, it be, continues to say this. It says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. 
Now, I know we look at Romans chapter 8 and verse 14 as a measure sometimes. We want to know who's saved and who's not. And so we'll look and say, oh, those who are led by the Spirit of God, now that, that's the sons of God. And people who are in the flesh and, and walking, not in the flesh, but walking after the flesh and, and not following the leading of the Spirit, we say, oh, they're not, they're not a Christian, they're not a believer. But I want to tell you that Romans chapter 8, verse 14 is not written for you to measure someone's salvation by. It's a declaration of a fact. For instance, there is the, it begins with the word for, and it's telling us the reason why it is that we, through the Spirit, can mortify the deeds of the flesh and live. How is that possible? Well, it's possible because it says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. It's because the Spirit of God is working and leading in our life, and that makes it possible for us to be led of the Spirit, to mortify the deeds of the flesh, and live for God. Well, the next verse asks the question, well, how is it that we are led by the Spirit of God? So, because verse 15 begins with a verse four, with the word for as well, which is going to explain the reason that we can be led by the Spirit of God. For, uh, for ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. You're led by the Spirit of God because you've been given the Holy Spirit. He bears witness with your spirit that you're a child of God. And the Spirit is in you, therefore leads you, therefore you can mortify the deeds of the flesh. That, that's, that's what the reasoning is in the passage. That's the reason verse 14 is there, is to tell you that you can be led of the Spirit of God and ought to be led by the Spirit of God. Well, those previous verses tell us that since God has given to us His Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ has paid for all of our sins, we're not debtors to live after the flesh. You don't owe it to your flesh to live sinfully for the fulfillment of the desires of the flesh. You don't owe your flesh nothing. But you do owe God everything, don't you? You do owe it to God to walk after the Spirit, to mortify the deeds of the flesh, and live for Him. You owe Him that. And, and, and that's, the, that's the intent of these verses, is to make sure that you know where your duties are as a believer. If you're saved by God's grace, then you owe it to God to live by His grace for Him and have a life that counts for Him. To have your life not to be yours, as the Apostle Paul says, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. How does that done? That's done through the Spirit, mortifying the deeds of the flesh and living. Why is it? Because the Spirit of God would lead you to do that. That's what the Spirit of God is in your life to do. And, and, you have, and you're led of the Spirit, and you have the Spirit. Now, I'm going to come back to verse 14, but let's take it backwards so that you understand the importance of why Paul is saying this. In verse 15 it says, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Now he's explaining in verse 15 how is it that you're led by the Spirit of God. It's because we haven't received a spirit of bondage to fear, but we have received, it's called the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Now, the spirit of adoption speaks about God giving to us His Holy Spirit. And if God puts the spirit of His Son in us, we become sons of God. That's what this passage is declaring. But that spirit of adoption needs to be more than in your mind that, okay, I'm not a child of God until I get saved. And when I trust the blood of Jesus Christ, God puts the spirit of His Son or the spirit of God in me, and I become a son of God. Now, hopefully you know that. Now, you listen closely to the world, the world will say, we're all the children of God, and we're not. The Bible acknowledges we're all the offspring of God. God is our creator, the creator of all of us, but we're not all the children of God. The Bible says we're all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. It's only when you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior that you become a child of God, and the way, the means by which you become a child of God, God gives to you the spirit of adoption. Now, that doesn't mean that he adopts you into his family. It means that he gives you the spirit, and then you become his son. But that spirit of adoption means more than just that you become a child of God. The term here is the, a son of God. It says, for, if, for ye have not received the spirit of adoption, uh, the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And, and that, that spirit of Abba Father is speaking about sons. Verse 14, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, 
they are sons of God. Now, let me put that together in case you're not following what I'm saying. Come to uh, Galatians chapter 4. It'll explain it to you. Certainly, God has given to us his spirit, but his spirit is in us in such a way that it's called the spirit of adoption. And it's real important that you understand what the spirit of adoption is. It's important to your Christian life and how you're going to live your Christian life. Uh, sometimes we live it by superstition because we don't understand how God is working in our life. In Galatians chapter 4, in fact, Paul is speaking about the same subject here. Uh, I just quoted you chapter, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 26 where it says, For we are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. We talked about us being baptized into Jesus Christ. That's verse 27 of chapter 3 of Galatians. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Therefore, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ, in, in Christ Jesus. Uh, chapter 3 of Galatians, verse 29, uh, look at this verse and keep it in your mind for later on. It says, and if, ye be, and if ye be Christ, that is, you belong to him, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now, what promise is he talking about? Well, look back in the same chapter, chapter 3 and verse... Uh, 21. Is the law against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness would have been by the law. Now, the law was given not to give people eternal life. And, and Galatians 3 will explain why the law was given. But what I want you to concentrate on, when it said there in verse 29, if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise the promise is the promise of life. And I want you to associate right at this point, you'll see why later on, associate that being an heir is being an heir of life. When it talks about inheriting eternal life, that means it's receiving the gift and the promise of life that you're going to dwell with God in eternity. That's being in the kingdom of God. And being an heir of life is, is, is what it's talking about there, that if you, be, if, if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Heirs of life. Now, Romans, Romans chapter 8 is going to be talking about heirs. It says, if children, then heirs. That's, I'm getting ahead of myself, but I wanted to show it to you there. But, but the first thing that it taught in Romans chapter 8 is about the spirit of adoption, that we are led by the spirit of God. We're not brought into bondage again to fear but we have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Well, Galatians 4, verse 1 is going to explain the spirit of adoption. Now I say that an heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. Now, you take a rich home, and you take a, a, an eight-year-old boy, maybe the first son of a, of a man who has a great fortune, to pass on to a son? Well, if his son's only 10 years old, even though he is an heir, he differs nothing from a servant. He's told when to get up, when to go to bed, when to go to school, when to study. He's told everything. He's, he's always constantly, constantly dictated to what to do and when to do it. So he doesn't, even though he's heir, he differs nothing from a servant. Though he be Lord of all, he's going to inherit everything of his father. It says until, it says in verse 2, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. In Jewish custom, there's a time when which a father would say, okay, my, my child, my son, is no longer going to be looked at as a child. He's now uh, of an age of accountability, and I'm going to acknowledge he's no longer a child, he is a son. And, and what that is, that is, a, that is a time in which the father is going to bestow upon his son all the rights and privileges of heirship. That no longer is the servant going to tell him what to do and when to do it. As a son, he is now going to be responsible for his life, and he is going to take control. He's going to take some authority. He is going to receive some responsibility and accountability because he's going to be treated as an adult now, no longer be treated as a child. And so the servant's going to be pretty careful of how he talks to this man's son because the son's no longer a child, he is a son. And that, that, that is what it's talking about here. There's a time appointed of the father in which that is so. Now verse 3 says, Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the, ele uh, under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time ca uh, was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, 
that we might receive uh, the adoption of sons. And because we are sons, God has sent forth his spirit into our hearts, uh, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, ye are no more servant, but a son. And if a son, an heir of God through Christ. Howbeit then, when ye know not God, ye did service unto them which are by nature no gods. But now that ye have known God, or rather known of God, how is it that ye, uh, that ye again turn to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto you desire to be in bondage? And what he's warning the Galatians is that you're no longer children under the law, so why do you go back to that? There came a time in which God sent Jesus Christ forth into the world. He took care of our sins, and he has given us the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. We have God's Holy Spirit in us now, and we no longer have to live under the elements of the law. We are now considered sons of God. And what sons of God are is someone who's not dictated to what to do and when to do it. We have God's Holy Spirit in us, maturing us to know what we ought to do. What, what do you do with a child is you teach a child when he's young what's right, what's wrong, what he ought to do, what he shouldn't do, and, and what he should do, and there comes a time in his life, then now he's held accountable for doing it. And, and that's what God has said we are in the progress of time. We who have trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior, we're no longer dealt with by God as children, we're dealt with by God as sons because he has given to us his Holy Spirit and the Spirit in, of God in our life with the completed word of God available to us, we are now held responsible to make up some of our own decisions on how to live for God. We don't go back to the weak and el beggarly elements of the law. We make some decisions. You know, I prayed for you today before you got here. I prayed not that, that you would come here because this is Sunday and at 11 o'clock or 10 o'clock, whatever you choose to do, on Sunday, this is the holy day, this is the door, day the Lord's made, this is the holy Sabbath day, and you come because you're obligated to come on Sunday. None of that is true. And I pray that none of you would be here today for that reason. But you know what? I, I also pray that you didn't stay home. Because I prayed that as responsible sons and daughters of God, that you would realize there's some decisions you have to make in life and that you can make the right decision and God would have his saints assembled together, that the church is a place where we come and are comforted and edified and exhorted by one another and built up in the holy faith. And since you're a son of God and you can make your own choice, whether stay home or not, whether worship Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, whatever you want to do, but that today was an available time set aside for the saints to meet together, I pray that you would make the right decision to be here this morning. But do you see the difference between living under the law and living as a son of God? The spirit of adoption, whereby you have been given God's word, you know what right and wrong is, and you'll be given the spirit of God so that you could say no to the flesh and yes for God, so that you don't have to live a dead life, you can live the life of Christ here and now, that you would make that choice and mortify the flesh and live. But that's a choice you make. God, that, God is dealing with us in the age of grace by the, him giving us his Holy Spirit today. We're being dealt with in a new way. And that's why Romans chapter 8 is saying, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are sons of God. The emphasis in that verse is being led. Why are we led? We're not under bondage again to fear, but we have been given the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Because we've been given that spirit of adoption where we can address God as Abba, Father. By the way, outside of Romans 8, Galatians uh, 4, where you see this witness of crying Abba, Father, Abba, Father is only mentioned one other time. I think it's in Mark where Jesus Christ addresses God the Father when he's praying in the garden and he says, Abba, Father. Abba is a, is, is a term that's not just a term that's Father like our Father which art in heaven. It's a term that, that, that talks about dearness and closeness in relationship. It's one that up until this point only Jesus Christ ever addressed God the Father as Abba, Father. But Paul is saying now that we have the Spirit of God in us, we can address God like Jesus Christ addressed God in the dearness and the closeness of our relationship to him, we can call him Abba Father. And you know, with the spirit of adoption in us, it doesn't mean that we make up our own minds apart from the wisdom of God. If we're an adult son, the best thing an adult son can do is when he faces a situation that he doesn't know what to do, you know what he does? He asks the father, Dad, I'm in a situation here, and uh, what would be your advice to me? That's what a responsible, mature son would do in a case that he doesn't know what to do. He turns to the father. 
and God would have us turning to him and crying, Abba, Father, what's, what's your choice for my life in this situation? And making those decisions. But see, God is not dictating to us under the law how to live. God today is working in us by his word and by his spirit to make, let you make some choices in life. That's living by grace. That's the freedom that you have in grace. But you can make wrong choices as well as you can make right choices. But you don't have to make those wrong choices because we have the scripture that's God's guidance to us. We have prayer available to us so that we can make the right decisions in life. But you know, you need to realize that God is letting you make choices. And I'm not sure all the Christians understand that. I know many of them are going back to the law saying, is it right to do this? Is it right to do that? Should I go here? Should I go there? And maybe asking a pastor, asking another elder, asking, asking those questions to someone else rather than realizing, hey, wait a minute. God's word will instruct me on those things. Uh, there's some people that I, I heard this three weeks ago, I think it was on the radio, and I thought to myself, boy, that's exactly, she's missing the whole point. A lady was being interviewed, and the, the interviewer, she was a single lady, and the question was this, are you single by choice or are you single by God's choosing? And she says, well, I really think the answer to that is, is one answer. I'm single because I choose what God has chose for me. And, and what she is declaring, and it was real, real touching, how in her life, she's 40-something years old, never found a man, never been married, and since God has never given her a mate, she has now chosen to be single the rest of her life because she's going to choose what God has chose for her life. Well, let me tell you, God didn't choose that for her life. She needs to realize that she might be 45, but if she finds a man that, that is suitable to be a spiritual leader of, of, of her life, that she has every freedom under grace to choose that man to be a husband. See, what I'm saying to you is, is the things that you go through in life, God didn't choose those things for you. You are, you are a mature son of God, and you're going to make decisions in your life, and you're going to be re responsible for those decisions. Some people will choose the wrong mate to be married to, and they'll be, they'll be accountable for that decision. Some will choose the right, but God gives the choice to you. He gives you spiritual guidance. He gives you wisdom in the Scripture. But God doesn't choose for you to be single or married. And on rare occasions, in the sense that the Apostle Paul talks about some are eunuch by God, that is, that God has made them in such a way that there's no desire for marriage or sexual relationship, then, then in that case, you could say maybe that God has made you in such a way that you, you don't need to be married and therefore shouldn't be married. But, but for you to say that I'm going through life because you couldn't find a mate or haven't yet found a mate, and saying, God has chose me to be single. No, God didn't choose that. Maybe you chose that, but you got some choices in life. And you need to realize, though you have choices to make in life, and what Romans chapter 8 is telling you is that you can follow the leading of the Spirit, making those choices, and the reason that you're being led of the Spirit of God is because that's how God is working in the age of grace. And so go back to Romans chapter 8. That's why it's declaring about mortifying the flesh. The reason you can mortify the, uh, through the Spirit, can mortify the deeds of the flesh, for as many as are led. That's what the Spirit of God is doing. By the way, not all believers will follow that leading. But Romans chapter 8, verse 14 doesn't say, for as many as are following the leading of the Spirit, they are the sons of God. I think that's how we read it all the time. But it's saying, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. You know who the Spirit of God tries to lead? everyone that, that he has been given to by God. He didn't just single out to lead one and not the other. Every child of God who has the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit leads. The trouble is some children will to, choose to walk after the flesh, to grieve the Spirit, to quench the Spirit, and not follow the Spirit. But the Spirit is leading every one of them so that there's no excuse. And they don't, you don't have to walk after the flesh. You can walk after the Spirit because the Spirit is there to lead you. And we have not received the spirit of bondage, again, to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Now, the spirit, we haven't received the spirit of bondage, again, to fear. Under the law, they lived constantly with fear of being cut off from God. But we, don't, we never live under that fear. Later in Romans chapter 8, you'll find out nothing can separate us from the love of God. We have been given to that Holy Spirit, and that Holy Spirit has sealed us unto the day of redemption so that not only are we not under the law, we're not under fear anymore either. We're united with God 
By the relationship of us trusting in Jesus Christ and him giving us his Holy Spirit, we are eternally united to God where we don't ever have to fear again. We have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father, eternally, intimately related to God the Father by the spirit that's been given to us. And that's why verse 16 says, the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Now, you know, I, I... It says, God's spirit bears witness with our spirit. Well, you realize that in your spirit, you made a decision. The spirit is the seed of your intellect. In your spirit, you made a decision to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior and to be a child of God. And as soon as you made that decision, God puts his Holy Spirit in you, and the Holy Spirit in you confirms to God the Father, bears witness, and says, yes, he is your child. And by the witness of two, everything is established, right? So you bear witness in your spirit that you're going to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior and become a child of God. And immediately God's Spirit comes in and bears witness with your spirit that you are a child of God. That that talks about your security in Christ. That's why that verse says you're not under bondage to fear anymore, but you have received the spirit of adoption and that the spirit of adoption has come in and bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. That's a fact. It's established. It's settled eternally by God's Spirit. It's interesting that not only does it say here in verse 16, the Spirit, uh, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Now, you probably don't have Galatians, but right where we were reading in Galatians, let me read that to you. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 6 says, And because ye are sons of God, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. According to Galatians 4, 6, the Spirit of God in you cries, Abba, Father. According to Romans chapter 8 and verse 16, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Our spirit is declaring that we are a child of God, and it bears witness with our spirit. Both myself and the Holy Spirit is crying out, Abba, Father, bearing witness that we are the children of God. Now, So we have this eternal uh, life given to us from God, and we are children of God. And verse 17 of Romans chapter 8 says, And if children, then heirs. Now remember I asked you to think about what it meant to be an heir. First of all, what it means to be a son means to have, have the privilege and responsibility and right of inheritance. I mean, naturally a father is going to pass down his inheritance to a son. So just to be a son of God is to have the privilege and responsibility and rights of a child. Then, so that's the first thing, the spirit of adoption. Then what does it mean to be an heir? Because verse 17 says, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God. To be an heir of God is to share in life of God, is to, is to share in his life. Come to Romans chapter, no, Acts chapter 26. Now, perhaps you're not familiar with the fact that the heirship of eternal life was something that was promised to the nation of Israel. I think of the rich young ruler who came to Christ and said, what good thing must I do to be saved? And Christ says, if you will inherit eternal life, you must. And he talked about them inheriting eternal life, and of course, they were approaching God under the law. But when you come to uh, uh, Acts chapter 26, the apostle Paul is talking about his conversion on the road to Damascus. That took place after the Lord ascended back into heaven. And and after there's a continued ministry to the nation of Israel, in Acts chapter 9, Jesus Christ from heaven reached down and saved a man called Saul of Tarsus and, and called him to be Paul, the apostle of the Gentiles. Now, the Gentiles, that's what we are. The nation of Israel are the Jews. We're the Gentiles. That is, every other nation uh, that wasn't Jewish. And God saved the apostle Paul, and it says... Uh, that when the, lo- the Lord appeared unto him, it says in verse 15, and I, and, and, and I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But arise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of those things which thou hast seen, and of those things in which I will appear unto thee. So the Lord not only appeared to the apostle Paul on the road to Damascus, but he says, I'm going to appear to you more and give you more reason, more things to say and to testify about me. 
But he says here, delivering thee from the people, that is, God says, I'm going to deliver you from the Jews and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee to open their eyes, to turn them. That is, Paul's going to be sent to us Gentiles to open our eyes, to turn us from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, that they might receive the forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among them that are sanctified by faith that is in me. Israel was receiving the heir, the, the, the inheritance of eternal life. And God saved the Apostle Paul and says, I'm sending you to the Gentiles to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, so that they might receive an inheritance among them that are sanctified by faith that's in me that us Gentiles might have an opportunity to believe on Jesus Christ and receive eternal life, to become an heir of, of life. And the, that's the ministry of the Apostle Paul, to come and to preach to us about eternal life. Look at uh, Rome, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Now here's people that don't have their sins forgiven, have not trusted in the blood of Jesus Christ, do not believe that he paid for their sins. It says in, in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the king... Uh, know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. One of the things that we just said from the very beginning of our lesson is, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Being justified means I'm declared righteous. That's what the word means. So when I read that verse, that's not talking about me. The unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. I've been declared righteous by God because Christ has paid for my sins, and when I believed on it, he put his righteousness to my account, and I'm saved by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So this is a person who has not believed on Jesus Christ yet, and it says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effemates, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. They won't inherit and such were some of you, but ye are washed, ye are sanctified, ye are justified in the name of Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So we have been, we have been uh, washed, we have been sanctified, we have been justified in the name of Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God, therefore we are heirs of the kingdom of God. You see that in that verse? So if we're children then we're heirs. That is, we're heirs of eternal life. We have eternal life because God not only put his spirit within us to lead us through this life, but to give us everlasting life. So we're sons of God now and forever, and we're heirs of eternal life. But not only that, Romans chapter 8, see if we can cover one more of these yet today, and maybe we'll only cover it in part. Look again at Romans chapter 8, because it's building on what we have in Christ by the fact that God has given to us his spirit. Not only have we have received the spirit that, that leads us in this life to live for the Lord, but it says, verse 16, if I get there, it says, the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. Not only am I an heir of God, and by an heir of God it means that I have eternal life. I'm going to be in the kingdom of God. I'm going to live forever in God's kingdom. But I'm also a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Now my, my brother and I and my sister and a couple other sisters that aren't here, uh, we're joint heirs of our parents' fortune or misfortune. <laughs> It's not something to be coveted after, at least what I know now, unless I got something stashed away I don't know about. But, uh, <laughs> but you know what? It, to be an, a joint heir with Jesus Christ means that not only you're going to be an heir of eternal life, but you're going to share in everything God is going to give to his son. You know what God gave to his son? Look at Hebrews chapter 1. In Hebrews chapter 1, it says in verse 1, chapter 1, verse 1, God, who at sundrous times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir 
of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. The Lord Jesus Christ, God the Father, has appointed Jesus Christ to be heir of all things. He's going to inherit everything that's been created. Everything is going to center around Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is going to inherit all things. And not only am I going to be an heir of life, not only am I going to have eternal life, I'm going to be a joint heir with Jesus Christ in all that he is going to receive of God the Father. And that is the whole world, all the worlds, all the universe. I'm going to share in that what Jesus Christ is going to receive. Now, the way that I'm going to receive it, and I'll just introduce it this week, we'll pick up with this next week, but let's end with Colossians chapter 1. I mean, if he receives everything, how can I receive everything? Well, I share in everything that he receives. I'm going to be a part of what, what God is going to do through Christ. And in Colossians chapter 1, our part is described in great clarity here. Uh, great detail, too, so we'll pick up the detail next week, but just to give you the understanding, it says in, in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 12, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. God has sought fitting to allow us to be part, a partaker of the inheritance of the saints. So we're going to learn about our inheritance. Who hath, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created. Now remember, he's going to be heir of all things. By him, by Jesus Christ, were all things created that are, that are in heaven and in earth. and invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, all things were created by him and for him. That is, Jesus Christ, God, gonna, Jesus Christ is going to inherit all things, but all things include all things that are in heaven and all things that are in earth. The things in heaven are invisible to us, but they're there. The things of earth are visible to us. There's things invisible and visible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities, that has to do with the governments of the heavens and the governments of the earth. Jesus Christ is going to inherit the government of the universe. And, and we're, we, we have been made partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. We're going to share in Jesus Christ's government of the universe. And you know where our place is to govern? Well, it says in verse 17, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist, and he is the head of the body of the church. That's who we are. Who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. You come back next week, and I'm going to show you how the nation of Israel was God's plan to make Jesus Christ preeminent over all the earth. And that is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. But that Jesus Christ became the head of the body of the church. He became the head of you and I, the body of Christ so that in all things Jesus Christ might have preeminence. God didn't want Je Jesus Christ just to be preeminent on the earth. He wants Jesus Christ to be preeminent over all things, heaven and earth. And that's why the next verse says, uh, 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 For it pleased the Father that in him all fullness should dwell. The fullness of the universe is going to dwell in Jesus Christ. And our place that we're going to reign with Christ is heavenly places. So, by the fact that God has given us a spirit of adoption, we're sons of God right now. By the fact that, that we have been made children, we're heirs of God, we, ha we, have, we're, we have the inheritance of eternal life. But as a joint heir with Christ, we have a reigning position in the heavens throughout eternity with Jesus Christ. And there's even more to be described in those verses. I just say to you in closing, that, you know, the world will always blame their parents for all their misfortune, all the things they do wrong. Oh, I, I, I didn't have a good upbringing, and therefore I, I'm not what I should be in life, and I make too many mistakes, and it's really my parents' fault. And you know what I say to those people? Well, you're an adult, grow up. Quit blaming the past. If you're an adult, make right decisions and grow up, make them right now. But you know what I say to you as a believer? If God has given you the spirit of adoption, put his spirit in you, and God has declared you're an adult son. 
You have no right to be living in the flesh. Who are you going to blame when you live in the flesh? Your dad? God the Father? No, you have no one to blame but yourself choosing to walk after the flesh. If he's given you that spirit of adoption, what I say to you, grow up in the faith. Grow up spiritually and live for God. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that, uh, that we've been challenged by your word to realize what you have given us in Christ, not only the forgiveness of sins, but the power to live a holy life. And Father, that, that you have given us a life eternal, an inheritance of life, and you've made us join heirs with Christ. Father, may we realize what rights, privileges we have in Christ, and therefore what responsibility we have to live for you, even now. We pray this in the Savior's name. Amen.